Okay, so we are moving on in genetics, and we're going to be talking about cytogenetics, um, which is basically the study of chromosomes and chromosome abnormalities. So chromosome and chromosome abnormalities occur relatively often, one out of every 150 or so live births. Um, most of them are going to occur in the first trimester, and then a portion of them will occur in the second trimester. Uh, many of these are going to lead to spontaneous abortions, and they are um, going to be important in, with respect to morbid, morbidity and mortality. Now we're going to talk about some chromosome abnormalities that are viable. This does not mean these are the only abnormalities that actually occur. Of course, other abnormalities can occur, but they typically tend to be non-viable. So the first thing we have to consider is how we actually look at chromosomes. How do we view chromosomes? Um, and so there's several ways you can do this. You can disrupt the spindle by using different poisons, and this allows to um, stop the dividing cell and it arrests, and you do this um, in metaphase, and then of course you can see the chromosomes. And then you also want to apply a hypotonic solution, and this is going to cause rupture of the nucleus. Um, so again, you're basically trying to um, visualize the chromosomes, so you want to disrupt the nucleus to get them out of the nucleus. And then you use some staining materials. Again, the staining is going to be very common. You're going to see dark and light bands, um, and you're going to be able to um, view a karyotype or karyogram, which is basically a karyogram is when a genetics um, person lines up the chromosomes. So of course you have two chromosomes for your autosomal chromosomes, and then you have two sex chromosomes. It'll depend if you are a genetic male or a genetic female, whether you have an X and a Y. A genetic female, of course, would have two Xs. Um, but the idea of a karyogram is to line up the chromosomes so you can see, are there any abnormalities? Now, you also have to be considerate of the type of staining and that you actually are doing some sort of disruption to the cell. So the chromosomes might not look 100% perfect, um, but with the staining pattern, you can see if there are differences in the chromosomes. So for example, if you look at chromosome 7 shown here, one of them looks very different. However, if you look at the actual banding pattern, you can see it has a dark band here, a dark band here, it has a dark here, a dark here, a dark here, a dark here. So the banding patterns actually look similar. So the actual look of the chromosome might just be an artifact of the actual staining, not a true um, defect in the actual chromosome. So chromosomes are going to be classified based on where they are. Um, so you're going to have um, different sizes of chromosomes. Um, you're going to have some that are longer, some that are shorter. The Y is much smaller than the X, for example. There is also classification based on the position of the centromere. So here the centromere is in the center, so that's referred to as a metacentric chromosome. And here you have the centromere where it's favoring um, one side or another, and that's submetacentric. And then you also have the case where you have um, a centromere, and it literally is um, separating the chromosomes based on genes on one side, and on the other side is what's called a satellite. And oftentimes you lose those satellites. Um, um, genes, and that's an acrocentric chromosome. The short arm is given the P designation for petite, and the long arm is given the Q designation for cute. And so for a metacentric, um, oftentimes the P, short P, and the long Q can be the same. Um, however, there has to be a uniform um, numbering system because if you want to communicate with each other, then uh, you have to know which arm you're on, which area of the chromosome you're discussing with respect to an individual patient. So what is cytogenetics? Cytogenetics is pretty straightforward, study of chromosome structures, inheritance, etc. So chromosome disorders are clinically defined and it has to do with the actual chromosome number or they're going to be visually different. Um, so you can have duplications of, of areas of chromosomes, you can have insertions, other types of things can happen. It just doesn't have to be a whole chromosome is either um, added or deleted. It can be um, partial as well. Um, and then cytogenetics, chromosome 
abnormalities are of course going to be a major category of genetic diseases. Um, they are going to be one of the high causes of what's referred to as reproductive wastage. And reproductive wastage is that within a uh, population, of course, to keep the population going, you have to have um, reproductive, you have to have offsprings. And so a loss of a potential offspring due to some um, abnormality during development is referred to as reproductive wastage. And also you can have a lot of um, physical traits that are going to be caused by, of course, these chromosome abnormalities, which can lead to um, mental retardation, congenital malformations, uh, and various other um, phenotypes. So this is the definition of reproductive wastage. It is fetal loss, abort spontaneous abortions, um, etc. And these are going to be um, non-viable alterations in genes. And so uh, those that go to live birth, of course, are viable and we have clinical um, diseases associated with them. Um, but not all um, uh, chromosome abnormalities are going to be viable. All right, some of the early indications of chromosomes are just going to be a failure to meet certain milestones. So if you've ever had children, you go to your pedi pediatrician and they're doing things like they're measuring the height, the um, diameter of the skull. They're measuring certain things because proportion is key to make sure that um, everything is going okay. When you see sort of changes in the development pattern of, an, of a baby, that sort of triggers that maybe there could be some sort of genome influence on the development of the uh, individual. And so these can, of course, be for development delay. They're not able to feed um, on their own early. They cannot crawl when they should be crawling. They cannot walk when they should be walking, talk, etc. Um, chromosome, other reasons to analyze chromosomes is if you have a patient who has a baby, but the baby is born dead, so stillbirth, or a neonatal death. And so this will provide information to the couple about whether this was a spontaneous occurrence or whether future pregnancies will actually be um, effective. Um, other things are whether or not a person or a couple is having problems um, uh, having fertility problems, and oftentimes this can have a genetic influence, as well as family history can, uh, can show that you have potential consanguinity, potential recessive traits being uh, fed through your family tree, etc. Now for neoplasia, um, it can also be use, useful for diagnosis of those, um, and also Chromosome analysis is done typically when you have a mother of advanced age and it will be commonly performed just to determine if there are any abnormalities with the fetus um, chromosomes. So here's just a picture of chromosome banding. And so there is a uniform system of chromosome classification. Again, we have the P, oops, sorry, we have the P for short the Q for long, and then each chromosome is going to be divided into regions which are called cytogenetic bands. Um, and so you can see, if I blow this up a little bit, uh, we have chromosome one here, and we have the P arm here, and the Q arm here, and then you have bands one, two, and three. The bands start numbering from the centromere towards the telomere. And so one is by the centromere, two is sort of in between, and then three in this case is at the telomere. Different chromosomes have different numbers of these cytogenetic bands. Um, and then within the bands are genes. And so you're going to start counting the genes from the centromere towards the telomere. And you're going to use the bands as a reference for the counting. Um, so for example, if we do a 14Q332, often people say this looks like 32. Um, so what this is telling you is that you're looking at chromosome 14, which I have here somewhere. Here's chromosome 14. Um, you're looking on the Q arm, which is the longer arm, um, and you're looking in band 
of the third region, so band three, and position two. So here's the band three, and then within that three, you're gonna have position one, 1.1, 1 1.11, 1 1.1, 1 1 et cetera, and then you get to two, and so that's the region that you're looking for here. Okay. Now, one other thing about this, um, we have some nomenclature up here in this little box. Um, so you have pale staining or negative staining. We'll talk about those. We'll talk about the different staining patterns. Um, and so the negative staining is going to be with Q and G banding um, staining techniques. However, the pale is going to be positive staining when we do a reverse band or an R band. Um, and then that's different for the darker colors here. So when we, do, when we talk about Q and G staining techniques, these are going to be the positive. And when you talk about reverse, those darker ones are going to be the negative. Um, and also you have at the ends of the chromosomes are going to be the telomeres, as I said before. And so depending if they're on the P or the Q, you will have, for example, a P telomere, which is P tel, and then you'll have a Q tel for Q telomere. And so those are just some of the nomenclature for chromosome identification. So to do the staining, there are three common patterns. The first staining pattern that was identified it was called Q banding. This uses a fluorescent stain. So this fluorescent stain So you can see that it's staining green. Um, and so quinacridine is a dye that you can use to stain these. Um, and you're going to have um, bright bands and you're going to have um, dimmer bands. The bright bands tend to be AT rich and the <clears throat> dimmer bands tend to be GC rich. Okay, and so this is just one mechanism that was used to um, identify the different chromosomes. Now, most people are more familiar with the um, GIMSA staining of chromosomes, and this is also called G-banding, G-band or GIMSA staining. Um, this uses an acidic acid fixation, so you have to add acidic acid. And then you do a drying technique. Um, and then you have to denature the chromosomes. And this is typically done with heat very easily. You just heat up the chromosomes to denature them. You can also use different enzymes to denature them. Uh, regardless, you need to denature. And then after you denature them, then you can stain with Gimsa. These are going to be similar to the Q pan bands. Um, you're going to have the AT, which is going to be dark. And then you're going to have the GC, which is going to stain light. Okay, so those two banding patterns are very similar. Um, the fluorescent banding pattern, of course, you need a fluorescent microscope to see that banding pattern. Um, whereas the gheme sustaining, um, you do not need that fluorescence. And then finally, there is the R staining, or what's known as reverse pattern of G banding staining. Um, so R stands for reverse of G banding. So in this case, um, you're going to pretreat the cells with a salt solution. And then after that, this is going to cause denaturization, and then you can stain. Um, and then in this case, you're going to denature the AT regions, and so you're going to get the reverse staining pat pattern, which the dark will be the GC, and the light will be the AT. I should actually cut that, sorry. This is in reference to the hot salt solution, of course. Um, so why this is useful is you can see if, 
you can see here that you're staining the ends of the chromosomes um, and so that is going to be very helpful with this type of staining so you can get these ends really nice and um, lit up. Okay, so now there are a few other techniques. There's something called constitutive banding, and this is going to help to identify the, the centromere, which is shown here. So you can see the centromere. And so this will help you to identify, of course, the P and Q band the arms, um, whether you have a, a acentric chromosome, metacentric, etc. You also have nucleolar organizing region staining, and this is going to highlight little satellites and the stalks of the acentric, so these stalks here. Um, and so that's going to be the NOR staining can help with those. So there is this, another staining technique called fluorescence in situ hybridization. Um, these can stain during your um, interphase, and this is going to be a, sort of like a probe staining. And so in order to use this staining technique, you have to know what you're targeting. You have to have a target for it. Um, and so because we do know the regions, for example, of Prader-Willi, um, as well as another disease called Williams syndrome, um, your probes can identify those. Um, and so you can use this specific, very specific technique. So you're not highlighting the entire chromosome, you're just focusing in on a specific area of the chromosome. Uh, there's also spectral karyotyping. Um, and so basically you are here, you're labeling each chromosome with a different color. And you can see that it looks very colorful. Um, and so here you can see that you have a few changes going on here. Um, let me use this. So you can see here on, on chromosome two, you have this very, very, very bright yellow band on one of the chromosome two, and it's not on the other chromosome two. And then if you look at 22 over here, you can see 22, one chromosome looks a little bit bigger than the other chromosome. And so what you're looking at here is a 46, because there's 46 chromosomes. We don't have any trisomies or monosomies here. We do have a genetic female. So here's our genetic female. So you have um, 46 XX, um, and then you have a translocation. TRL is for translocation of two between chromosome two and chromosome 22. And so this would be a karyotype of this individual. This individual has 46 chromosomes, two X chromosomes, but a part of chromosome two and 22 have swapped places. So that's basically what that means. Now another technique is called comparative genomic hybridization, G C G H. Um, and in this case, you are labeling DNA from a test source as well as from a control source. So you have a um, test or patient DNA, and then you always have to have normal or controlled DNA. Um, and then you're going to use these to hybridize together. Um, so you mix the DNA samples together and you hybridize them. Uh, you're going to label them differently, so they're going to be labeled with different colors, for example. Over here it shows the normal is sort of a greenish, and the, um, the other is sort of a pinkish. Um, and so you um, hybridize them, um, and then you determine whether or not you have any um, duplications. So this uh, microarray can allow for detection of duplications but, and deletions. So you can see duplications, deletions. However, you cannot see something called a um, balanced rearrangement. So balanced rearrangement means, for example, if we go back to this previous one, 
if chromosome 22 and chromosome 2 exchange information balance, so there's no change in the size of chromosome 2 or chromosome 22, you can identify this using spectral karyotyping, but comparative genomic hybridization would not be able to see that balanced rearrangement. So all the chromosomes would look very similar in size, for example. Um, the nice thing about these, you can detect um, relatively small deletions and duplications that are less than 100 kilobases in length. Um, so it does have uh, the ability to pick up uh, smaller areas than you would see from just a, a simple gene sustain, for example. All right, so let's start talking about um, the difference in chromosome um, numbers as well as their different abnormalities. So we have abnormalities of chromosome number and so this is referred to as polyploidy. So we have euploid. Um, a euploid cell contains a multiple of 23 chromosomes. Okay, so a normal euploid would be um, 46 chromosomes, a haploid, our gametes, are going to be 23, and our somatic cells are going to be diploid, and they're going to be 46. So gametes are haploid, so they're 23, and somatic are diploid, so they're going to be 46, right? So this is normal. So a polyploid is going to be the presence of extra chromosomes in a cell. Now a polyploidy can, is still euploid in, since it's going to be in multiples of 23. So this is going to be extra set of chromosomes. Uh, and, and this is again in multiples of 23. So you have tri-polyoidy, which is going to be where you have 69 chromosomes. Um, and so this is going to be, for example, 69XXX. Okay, so that just tells you you have 69 um, chromosomes, so you have triplicates of everything, including the X. Tetraploidy are going to be 92 chromosomes. And so in this case, you're going to be 92, X, 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 okay? Um, Tripolity is going to cause a lot of fetal loss in the first few trimesters, so spontaneous abortions. And if you are a tripoid um, that lives to term, you usually die shortly after birth. This is the same for the tetraploidy. Um, it's often caused by um, a fertilization of an egg by more than one sperm. So we have dispermy. And so you get um, another set of chromosomes in the fetus. Okay, so you can also have um, chromosome numbers with autosomal aneuploidy. So an aneuploid is a missing or additional chromosomes and it's not in multiples of 23. Okay, so you have monosomy, and that's the presence of only one copy of a chromosome. And this is usually fatal. And this makes sense because oftentimes you need both chromosomes 
for certain genes. And if you lose a chromosome, you're haploinsufficient, meaning you only have one copy of that gene, and it cannot compensate for the loss of the other copy of that gene. And so when you lose a whole chromosome, you increase the chance of haploinsufficiency, of course. Trisomy is going to be the presence of three copies of a chromosome. Now this is less severe, and it's because, again, you, you don't run into that haploinsufficiency. However, you can have too much of a product, of course, in a trisomy. You can have excess, but the body is more capable of tolerating genetic excess rather than um, a genetic deficiency. Okay, now the reason for aneuploidy is often caused by non junction, which of course is the failure of chromosomes to separate during um, meiosis. Okay, so this is just a picture or a diagram of non junction. So you have your parent, and your parent, um, of course, has um, the chromosomes. Um, and then during non-disjunction of meiosis one, those chromosomes get, um, do not separate. And so one gamete does not have a chromosome, um, and the other gamete gets two chromosomes. And then during um, meiosis two, you have your gametes that have two copies where they should only have one copy of that chromosome. It should be either from the grandmother or grandfather, that's what this is kind of showing. And then when you get fertilization with one gamete, you now have a trisomy. Um, so non-disjunction can also occur during meiosis two, in which one gamete, again, has a loss of a chromosome, um, and then your other gamete gains two, and then you get fertilized and you have a trisomy. Now, when you have a loss of a chromosome and you get fertilized, then you have that potential for haploinsufficiency and you have the monosomy. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about phenotypic characteristics. So with unbalanced karyotypes, sorry, this got way down there, so I'll write it up here. Um, so for monosomy, we have, again, this is an aneuploidy. and it's only one copy of a chromosome pair. Um, it can be a partial monosomy, and this just means that you didn't lose the whole chromosome, you just lost part of the chromosome. And they are, again, gonna be uh, very deleterious Um, and so typically complete monosomies where you lose a full chromosome are not viable. Um, except for Turner syndrome. And that's um, a loss of an X. Complete trisomies are going to be viable. Um, for several chromosomes, but for mon complete monosomies, they're not viable. Now keep in mind, a partial monosomy um, can be viable. Now when you talk about your trisomies, um, your trisomies are going to be, um, if you have complete, they are viable for chromosomes um, 13, 18, 21, X, and Y. Now for your trisomies, the, um, the 
phenotype is going to depend on the size of the inbound segment, whether it's um, a full chromosome, not partial chromosome, which regions and which genes are going to be affected. Um, and so your abnormality with respect to trisomies can be in a mosaic forms. Um, and mosaics are going to occur when uh, uh, mosaics forms occur when the mutation is going to be after conception. And so it's as your fetus is developing, um, the, you undergo non-disjunction, and so you get a mosaic of some cells that are normal, have the normal number of chromosomes, and other cells that have the trisomy form. And so, again, some cells will be normal, and then some will come from the trisomy, and so this will be a mosaic. Okay, so autosomal aneuploidy, we have our trisomies 21, 18, and 13. And 21 is going to be Down syndrome. And 18 is Edwards syndrome. And then 13 is Pateau syndrome. And then for sex chromosome aneuploidy, you have monosomy X, which is Turner syndrome. You have Kleinfelder syndrome, which is XXY. And you have trisomy X, which is, oops, sorry, 47 XXX. And then you also have 47XXY syndrome. Okay, so for chromosome 21, chromosome 21 is tolerable. It's the smallest human autosome, so it has the least number of genes. It's only 1.5% of the total DNA in a cell. And you can have tissue-specific mosaicism with this. Um, so the mosaicism can arise in the germline if you have germline uh, mosaicism. Um, typically, women who are less than 30 years of age have a recurrence risk of 1%. And then um, the risk, of course, increases with age. Um, the 1% recurrence risk, even for mothers less than 30 years old, is about 10 times higher than the population um, of that age. So if a, a person younger than the age of 30 does have a, a baby with a trisomy 21, they have a 10 times higher likelihood of having another baby with um, the trisomy 21. Um, so the genes that are linked to intellectual disability, this is one of the most common trisomies. So there's a lot of research on Down syndrome. Um, so one of the genes that is linked to this is called the DYRK1A gene. Um, and this is a kinase, and this can lead to, because it's a trisomy, it's going to be overexpressed. Um, and this is going to lead to 
uh, memory defects that was shown in mice. Now why this is thought to be um, also um, influenced uh, or attributed to intellectual disability, there is another um, gene on this chromosome called the APP. And this is an amyloid beta precursor protein. Now this gene also has overexpression again and this is associated with Alzheimer's disease in um, when the Down syndrome patients are presenting with Alzheimer's over the age of 40. And one of the reasons of this is because individuals who have partial trisomy in which the APP is excluded so you don't get overexpression of APP, then these individuals do not get Alzheimer's. So trisomy 21 or Down, Down syndrome um, can be shown here. So again, you have, in this case, we have a genetic male, and you can see on chromosome 21, there are three of them there. Um, and so the trisomy 21, in this case, is 47. That seven is because you normally have 46 chromosomes, but now you have an extra chromosome. This individual is a genetic male, XY, and you have an addition, that's what that plus means, plus 21. Now, alternatively, another individual might be a genetic female, but it would still have that 47, you gained a chromosome, and that plus 21 tells you which chromosome was gained. So this would be the karyotype for Down syndrome. So Down syndrome, typical um, symptoms are going to be short hands, stubby fingers, um, decreased survival with congenital heart defects being a primary um, cause of death, small round face, etc. Now trisomy 18 is called Edwards syndrome. And again, this is a trisomy, so we're getting an addition. So you see here you have your 47, 47. You have a genetic male or a genetic female. And then you have the plus 18, which is showing which chromosome is duplicated. And you can see that you have a higher incidence in females than males. And this basically means that females survive more than the males um, do. Um, and in trisomy 18, they're less viable than trisomy 21. Most will die after birth and only about 5% survive. And of that 5%, 80% will be female and 20% will be male. And there's a few um, uh, syndromes associated with this. And uh, apart from just the physical features, you also have cachexia. Cachexia, um, sorry. That is wasting. So um, they have almost a failure to thrive, um, nutritional problems and things like that. Um, you have also camptodactyl, permanent fix flexation of the fingers, cognitive impairments, which is common of these um, trisomies. So chromosome 18, again, is a bit bigger than chromosome 21. Uh, you have about 2.5% of the total DNA. Again, not huge, so that's why this is another tolerable um, trisomy. Associated with this is something called rocker bottom feet. So you can see the feet kind of flex upwards. Um, you also have a clenched hand with finger overlap, which is another sign of uh, trisomy 18. Now trisomy 13 is Pateau syndrome. And Pateau syndrome has, um, again, cleft palate, a lot of normal abnormalities. Um, abnormally closed eyes is associated with this, speech impairment, so again, developmental disorders, um, uh, disabilities, intellectual disabilities, um, etc. So um, a lot of things associated with these. Now, as everybody knows or has been told that trisomies increase with maternal age, and that's true. So typically under the age of 30, there's very few um, trisomies. Um, and as the mother ages, the incidence of trisomies occur, increase. 
So Turner X is a monosomy, and again, it's the tolerated one. Um, you're basically a 45X, so again, you're 45, which should be 46, um, and you only have one X. They're always going to be female. They have short stature, and they're going to be have a sexual infantilism. Sorry. Um, they are going to have ovarian dysgenesis. Physical features are going to be more of a um, broad webbed, webbed neck. You can see that this child here has very little neck, so it's a webbed neck that's very broad. Um, triangular face. It's kind of hard to see with um, hair, but if you drew a line, it would have like a sort of a triangle type face. Um, ex, uh, rotated exterior ears, posteriorly rotated exterior ears, and again, you can't really see it here because of the hair. Some are going to have heart defects. You have 50% will suffer from a bicuspid aortic valve. Um, others are going to have narrowing of the aorta. And then you can also have kidney defects. However, what's important here is they have normal intelligence. Now, Turner syndrome can be treated. Growth hormone will help to increase height. And then you can also have estrogen to help develop um, secondary sex traits. Diagnosis is going to be directly after birth if you do have that neck webbing or heart defect. And if not after birth, then when the person is uh, or the child is, does not grow, so it has short stature, then you can um, diagnose this. Now the genes involved in this are, well, at least one gene is the Shox gene. S-H-O-X. This is going to be a transcription factor um, that is going to be in embryonic limbs. And so this leads to um, short stature. This is going to be, shocks is expressed on both X and Y. And so when you only have one X, you have haploid insufficiency. Um, they also have chromosome abnormalities, so 50% are going to be 45X. And then you have some mosaicism also allowed. So you might have a 45X slash 46XX, so that, that means that some cells will be normal, some cells will have a monosomy. Or you can be a 45X um, and a 45XY, 46XY. Um, or you can have a structural abnormality, so this can be a partial deletion of the X. So you can also have partial, in which the full chromosome is not deleted. Now, Kleinfelder syndrome is 47XXY, and so in this case you have an extra X, and so these individuals are typically tall. Um, so again, it goes back to that um, shock, shocks gene. So now you have a um, too much of it. You have overexpression of that um, shocks gene. So you have, have very long arms and legs. 
um, you're going to be infertile, and this is due to an atrophy of your seminiferous tubules. Um, testosterone is going to be low. Um, you do have the ability, or it has a side effect of developing breasts in one-third of Kleinfelder syndrome um, patients, and so you have an increase of uh, risk of breast cancer. Um, intelligence is going to be normal, and you um, ha can have uh, some disabilities with verbal, um, with talking. Now, Kleinfelder syndrome is going to um, also can be 48 XXXY, 49 XX, etc. So these extra X's are maternally derived in 50% of the cases. Um, and of course, it's going to increase with maternal age. You can have mosaicism. Um, there, you can have viable sperm. And oftentimes, this is going to be diagnosed during puberty. Um, testosterone can treat um, for those secondary sex, sex traits. All right, some other sex chromosome aneuploidy is trisomy X. This is going to be caused mostly by maternal um, non-disjunction. Um, and this is going to, of course, be associated with an increase in maternal age. Uh, you're going to have normal um, physical, so people these individuals would look normal physically. Um, you're going to see females with four and five X chromosomes, and the more you increase the X's, the more the intellectual disability will increase. And then as you increase the excess, you can also start to have physical abnormalities. Uh, 47XYY syndrome, which is Jacob syndrome. This is, again, taller. Uh, mild IQ reduction. Um, this is going to result uh, when they took a... Um, a sample of prisoner populations they found a lot uh, or Jacob syndrome was overrepresented in prisoners populations it doesn't seem to be linked to violent behavior but it is linked to ADD so attention deficit disorder hyperactivity learning disorders um, and so here we have just your um, XX males and XY females and this is due to um, you have on your Y chromosome this SRY gene. SRY is for sex determining region on the Y chromosome. And if you get crossing a, a crossover that occurs below the SRY, your X chromosome now has the SRY gene and your Y chromosome lost the XRY gene. So even though you look like an, um, a, a genetic female or genetic male, that SRY locus has shifted and so it can drive expression of um, male genes in a female and you lose those male genes um, in males. All right, just really quickly going through some cancer. So we have, an, with respect to cancer, cytogenetics, um, you have a Philadelphia chromosome and the Philadelphia chromosome is a reciprocal translocation between chromosomes 22 and C9Q. And so what happens is you have the proto-oncogene, which is ABL.
and this is going to be moved from 9Q and it's going to go to 22Q and this is going to increase ABL expression. And so it's a proto-oncogene and so it can lead to cancer. And this is seen in most of your chronic myelogenous leukemia. There's also Burkitt lymphoma. Burkitt lymphoma is a reciprocal translocation from 8 and 14 chromosomes. So you have MYC, CMIC, which is a proto-oncogene. And it's moved from 8 to 24, and it goes to 14 Q32. And in this position, you have your heavy chain of your antibodies, which is a highly expressed um, gene in B cells. And so by moving the proto-oncogene with that heavy chain, you now have an increase in CMIC and an increase in cancer. So many cancers have been related to these types of translocations where proto-oncogenes are moved behind a gene that is highly expressed in the tissue that is um, the target of the cancer. And so this is just to show you all the different um, tumors that have been associated with cancers.